Hey, Michelle, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, did I send you the packets? Uh, yes. Yeah. If you need me yeah. to respond, them, let me know. No, I'll just hang on a second because I have to, I can't access my email from this computer, so I'm going to have to forward them to my other email. Okay. Yeah, my computer's, because it made me change my password, it isn't letting me get into Outlook right now. Hmm? Can you meow at me? Jeremiah? Yeah. Can I have all the packets except the ZBA packet? Can you send that to um, a different email? Um, yeah, give me a second. I'll have to forward it off my phone. Well, that's what I'm trying to do, and it's not loading. Um. Oh, wait, there it goes. Never mind, I got it. Got it? Yep. It just keeps asking me for my password, and I don't want to restart this thing because it's going to take two hours to start back up. Use my house computer at that point. Um, I don't know if Greg's going to make this. He'll make the planning commission, but I don't know if he'll make this one. Okay. The fair get grounds with Robin. Does she have any problems? No, she just wanted to show him because he's never seen her. Oh, okay. I told him it's fine. I wrote these reports anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, during the planning commission, I'm going to let you know, I might need you to allow me screen share um, to, if we need to use GIS. That's fine. I'm actually going to make you a co-host anyway, just in case my internet okay. does anything cute. So All I'll right. do that right now. So you should be able to do whatever you need to do. Get your laser. Ah, little laser. Laser. Mean old laser.
Michelle, can you individually unmute the commissioners? Or is that just, I don't know how that works. What is in there after mission? Since I was down at last month's meeting, is it best if we're all on mute or how is the best way to do that? You can mute yourself or unmute. I've, we made it so all the commissioners are unmuted. To prevent feedback, the best thing to do is leave yourselves muted until you want to speak. Otherwise, it tends to provide a lot of feedback. So if you okay. hit Alt A, it's a quick command to unmute. Or space bar. Space is your video camera. Thank you for telling me that. No, space on mute you, Jeremy. Does it? Space, Mine's space, turned, space bar. My camera off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. And space doesn't do anything for me, Mike. Really? Really? Oh, okay, that works on mine, so. Okay. If you hold the space bar down, you unmute yourself. Nope. <laughs> on mine. Hammer. Well, if you hear me telling my dogs to be quiet, then I have accidentally unmuted myself. Quiet dogs. My cat's chasing a laser. I'm hoping she stays away from my camera. Well, according to the clock on my computer, we're at 6.30. Are we waiting for anybody else at this time that we know of? We have a quorum. Then if everybody is uh, ready, we will call this meeting to order. Cool. I'd like to call to order the uh, August 4th meeting of the ZBA. Everybody uh, received, uh, commissioners I assume have received an email with the information and uh, a hard copy came in the mail for me today. I assume you have that also? Yes. yes. Can I address that part? 
Um, so I sent you guys an email um, just to save on postage. If I know some of you want hard copies and that was requested last time. Um, if you guys want them, can you guys email me and let me know and then I'll have them waiting for you. Um, but if you don't need them, um, we could save postage and it's definitely help a little bit with our notices that we send, which is in the three to four hundreds at this point each month. So just a just a note on that, sorry. Okay, thank you. The first item on tonight's agenda, the approval of the minutes from the uh, July 7th meeting. Everybody had a copy of that. Uh, once again, I was unable to attend, so I'll have to rely on everyone else for the information on that. Well, on that basis, I would note the correction that you did not call the meeting to order. <laughs> that it was Vice Chair Vealy in the first line there. Other than that, everything else looked okay to me. If so, uh, with that correction, I'll uh, make a motion. I would move to approve the minutes uh, as corrected. I'll second it. Uh, all in favor, aye, raise your hand, whatever <laughs> we can see you, I don't care. Aye. 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 Thank you. The next item in the new business, we have a request for 1215 uh, Brookshire Drive for a shed over 100 square feet. Now, once again, before we get into this, I would like to mention that uh, last month's meeting, I think you dealt with three of these. And once again, I was not in attendance at last month's meeting. So however you handled those last month, I'd like to be consistent in handling that. So maybe some of you who were there or Cindy, you were chairing the meeting, uh, can kind of uh, work us through this a little bit of how you uh, handle those? We, we, we are not asked to approve or disapprove them as I understand them. They have to come and let us know, but it wasn't really. No, no, we, we do need to approve them. We need and, to. And we did approve all three of the ones that came before us last yeah. month. But it's, um, it's not a variance, it's just... There's no finding of no. fact. There's no finding of fact. That is, is, the right. ordinance doesn't specify a finding of fact. Um, this is also on the Planning Commission's agenda for this evening as a discussion item uh, to consider a very, I changed the ordinance that uh, would eliminate a number of these, we would hope. So we just, uh, did you go down to uh, the staff review that I have in front of me here from our uh, for tonight's meeting, you just kind of went down through that instead of the finding of fact? Yes. Okay, first of all, uh, do we have someone from that residence here that would like to just briefly tell us what it is that they're looking to do? Sir, you're still muted. Okay, how's that? Better? Better. Yep, there you go. There we go. Okay. Uh, my name's Tom Hillebrand. My wife Cindy's here with me. She's the one that got me off on mute, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> what I'm looking to do is just to uh, put a 180 square foot Amish made shed on the back corner of, of our lot here for storage of uh, lawnmower and gardening supplies. And I've come to the uh, commission, I guess, just for the variance, uh, I talked to Jeremiah and he said it is requested uh, any shed over 100 square feet needed to be approved. Um, he did the, I read the staff analysis. I agree with everything that's on there. Um, the shed will match the, the home and he kind of highlighted uh, everything. It's uh, 18 feet from the southeast corner of our structure. The height is only 10 foot seven, and that it's made out of wood and vinyl siding to match our home. Commissioners, any questions uh, for the petitioner? I'm having a hard time reconciling the two images that we have and making them, it's not clear to me where it's going to be in relation to the corner of the lot. 
are they, let me put it this way. Are there any setback variances at issue with the plan that he has? No, not at issue. Um, okay. he, he's far from, from being close to anything. That okay, Th thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? No. I see we have some faces in here that I'm not familiar with. I know notices went out about this meeting. Is there anyone else in here uh, right now that would like to speak on this item? I can't tell. Tom, are you trying to speak there? If you are, we're not no. here. No, 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 sorry. Nope. I said uh, my piece. <laughs> There's another Tom. Tom Vern, I saw your lips moving. Were you trying to speak on this item? If so, we did not hear you. You are still muted. Yeah, you need to unmute your microphone. Oh, yes. There you, there, go. there you go. Very good, thank you. My name is Tom Vern. I'm a neighbor of the other Tom. And I live at 1206 Trenton Road, which backs up to Berkshire Address. Um, I was curious, two things. One, um, I thought, I was under the impression that Scott Ridge Subdivision had a, uh, a, uh, a ban on sheds in their uh, covenant of the subdivision banning sheds. Can you explain? No, that was, oops, excuse me. Can you uh, we did previously have that, but that was amended at our last meeting, and we have allowed it. That amendment is being filed along with the other amendment or original restrictions. There are currently two sheds in the neighborhood already. Okay, uh, I wasn't aware of of the of the uh, covenant being changed or removed. Uh, I don't have a problem with sheds in 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 generally speaking, but a shed of ten by ten, which is the size of the uh, city. Uh, does not need a various for up to that size, uh, but I have a problem with a shed that's ten by eighteen. That's that's not a shed anymore. That's that's to me is a garage, and uh, uh, I, I again I like to, like to accommodate the the need for a shed, but the ten by eighteen is is not a shed. It's, in our opinion, it's a garage, and that's pretty pretty good pretty good size shed. The um, the majority of the subdivision, when we look out, as I'm doing right now, uh, there are no sheds in our view. And it, and it does make for a, a, a good, much better looking, premium looking subdivision. Um, is there any particular reason why you need a shed that size? Uh, that was the one my wife is going to have, a small, I like to say a little gardening shed. I do have a mower, I do own two lots. And uh, that size, I felt that was going to be perfect to go ahead and house our gardening supplies and snowblower in it. Um, we have a two and a half car garage right now. Uh, we have no intention of storing anything but lawn and gardening supplies in it. It's uh, going to match the front of our house. We have a colonial house in the front in the roof line. And that was the uh, shed they actually offered that size. Which side will the doors open to, Tom? Um, the Berkshire, okay. towards Berkshire and then towards our house. There's a front door on it that will go towards Berkshire and the one that our mower will go into then would be towards uh, our house. In none, none facing yours. So the gable ends will be uh, on Berkshire and back towards Trent Hills? Berkshire, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, um, the size scares me. <laughs> I, I went in and looked at many of them, you know, definitely. And in order to get a, a snow blower and uh, I guess a lawn roller and a mower, uh, 40, you know, two inch mower to get into it. That was the size we felt we, we needed and wanted. You got room for one more mower? <laughs> Um, no, <laughs> uh, not without getting in trouble with my wife, so. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, if I if I can jump in. Um, so in the next meeting, we will be discussing shed sizes. I, we've seen quite a few of these under over 100 square foot. Um, you're right, this would not be considered a shed and what I'm going to propose, this would be more of a storage structure. Um, we have residential zonings that are R1, 2, 3, and 4. R1s are our larger lots. Um, so something like this would be appropriate for the size of this lot, um, whereas an R4 is a smaller lot. So we, I'm trying to come up with a way for us to do percentages that they cannot have a large shed on a tiny lot. He does have two lots. Um, his lot percentage, he would not meet anywhere close to his lot percentage. Um, I do agree the classification is a little strange as a shed. Um, it's more of a storage structure. Um, but realistically with what we're, we've been seeing um, and some of these ordinances that I've been looking at, almost 250 square foot is what a lot of cities are starting to go towards for storage sheds. Um, and that would be, you know, pending our discussion, um, you know, a 200 square foot could go in an R1 and then 100 square foot for the others. And then over that, we could go ZBA if that was, you know, the case. For what it's worth, the three we looked at last month, uh, two of them were 240 and the other one was a 200 square foot one. And we approved those and I believe none of them were a lot as large as the one we're looking at tonight. No, not, not at all. Could I make a comment? Yes, sir, go ahead. Now, there are actually two lots there. And the one lot that is is vacant mm -hmm. could always be sold later separately. And uh, well, again, I, my concern is that that's a rather large structure, but uh, I understand that the larger the lot, the, the large, large structure is not as, not as imposing. Uh, I don't know what the long-term plans are for this vacant, for the for the one vacant lot behind us. What's what are there side lot restrictions as as to sheds? No, Tom. I, I guess I'll kind of step in. We have no intentions to sell that side lot. We've merged the two lots together. As you can see, we've landscaped it. Yeah. And we we have no intention whatsoever to ever sell that lot. That's this is our whole total property now. So just to kind of put your peace of mind a little bit there. Okay. Okay, I needed to know that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And in answer to your question earlier, uh, the strategies need to go into the rear yard of the lot. They cannot be on the side. Okay, thank you. Oh, you can't be on the side. It has to go in the rear? Yes. The rear of the house or the rear of the... Uh, of well, it must be in the rear yard setback, so it, it can't be in the front yard. Um, I, I would have to look to see if we differentiate from the side, um, but we've yet to have anyone put them in the side. Or yeah, the, yeah, this actually one is 18 feet off of it, so it's behind my house to that one side where he's talking about that lot so you can see it from the front a little you know portions of it there i can't put it all the way back because of the swale that goes back there for the water yeah yeah okay well i appreciate the information Commissioners, any other questions, anything from commissioners? No. Uh, Cindy, just for my clarification, did you read through all these uh, staff review or did we just accept them as written last month? Um, I'm trying to think. I think we just accepted them. Let me go back to the minutes. Oh no, is the I'm getting confused with the dimensional variance that we also did. Um, for the sheds, we did not. We put them on the screen. We shared the screen so everyone could see them, but we didn't read through them. Okay, At, uh, based on that information, if the commissioners have no other questions, 
I would be uh, entertain a motion of how we want to handle this at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, uh, given that the proposed shed or outbuilding meets all of the specified criteria in the ordinance, um, I would move for approval of the request for this particular project. Do we have support for the motion? Who's, who's running the Zoom tonight? Michelle, Michelle is and, and I, it's kind of a, I'm learning it though, just yeah. be aware. <laughs> I think I'd feel better about voting if we would share screen and share the staff review before we vote. Yeah, Jeremy, I sent you a chat message. Um, I don't have the packet, so can you share it on your screen or email uh, it to me? Uh, yes, if you give me a second. Um, or if Greg can email it to me, I can share it. Email it to you really fast. What I had was from last month, sorry. Fine. Trying to, trying to find it. Send it to your work email. You should. You could be able to do a screen share. It's page nine. Um, the problem is, is we have to change our password every couple months and it made me change mine so i'm remoted into my work computer could you change it so that i can share i have it pulled up can you allow me to share i just emailed it to Once you he emails it to me it'll take me like thank you okay. just give me about two seconds here thank you thank this, you greg this is all above my pay grade so <laughs> did you Greg, did you send her PC too? No, I think I only did uh, CBA. I have, I have PC. Okay. The CBA I didn't have. If we're not going to read them, I'd like the people who aren't commissioners to be able to see what we're looking at. Understand. Thank you. We'll be pros at this by the time we don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It might speed the process, Mike, if you just went down through it and indicated the uh, right what it says. I I could do that if uh, that's what we need to do. If we're not able to pull it up. I'm pulling it up right now. Give me just it's a long, it's a long page of fine print. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking of the page nine, Mike, not the, oh, not okay. the ordinances, just the staff review. Oh, okay, sorry. I've got it. If you want me to read it. I've got it if you want me to share it. Cindy, I don't think you can share because if she lets you share, then everyone can share. Well, who's going to misbehave? We've, we've had it happen at the Planning Commission. Okay. All right. We've had, we've had that experience. Yeah. I believe she said she was just about ready to pull it out. I, I will start down through it, and then if she gets it, we'll continue on when she pulls it up, but I will start down through it. Thank you. In the uh, staff review, item number one, uh, accessory buildings shall not be erected in any, uh, shall not be erected in any yard, required yard except the rear yard. 
and in answering that statement that the proposed location for this building is in the rear yard. Number two, no detached accessory building shall be located closer than 10 feet to any main building, nor shall be located closer than three feet to any side or rear lot line in the R3, four district and five feet to any side or rear lot line in the R1 and two district. Uh, according to our notes here, this is 15, excuse me, 18 feet from the rear southeast corner and 40 feet from the rear lot line. This is well within the rear yard and acceptable. Item number three, no detached building, accessory building in R1 through R4 and all the other districts that are listed, I'm not gonna read them all here, uh, shall exceed one story or 14 feet in height. The height of this particular structure is 10 feet, seven inches. Number four, when an accessory building is in any residential business or office district is intended for other than storage of private motor vehicles, the accessory use shall be subject to approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Accessory building uh, with a floor area of 100 square feet or less, not subject to the ZBA approval. Uh, that's what we're dealing with here. The applicant's requesting 180 square feet of what we call an Amish shed in the rear yard. So that's why we're addressing this as we are, uh, are dealing with tonight. Number five, the accessory structure must be aesthetically compatible in design and appearance and at a minimum uh, constructed of material similar to the appearance and quality of the pri uh, primary structure. Uh, this preceding sentence withstanding non Commercial greenhouses as defined in section 2.68.05 are permitted in single family residential districts. Such structure shall meet all applied restrictions, building codes, setbacks, and lot coverage requirement for the district in which they are located. And the response to that is the shed will be made of wood and vinyl siding uh, with accompanying, with the picture we have to show that it does match the house. Item number six, no detached accessory building roof line shall exceed over the uh, adjacent property, nor shall the drainage from any accessory building roof be drained into the adjacent property. Uh, the location of this building provides the applicant would not cause any uh, foreseeable drain roof issue. It's far enough away from everything. So that is not a problem. And finally, the recommendation would be if the zoning board is comfortable with this size and location, uh, we would recommend approval uh, over 100 square feet. And we do have a motion to that. We did not receive a second on that motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now that we've been through the staff review, I am happy to second the motion. We have a motion. We have support. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, Jeremy, I assume we do a roll call vote as normal? Yes. Commissioner Strayer? Yes. Pulaski? Are they not? They're not here. She's here. Who? Who? We're Pulaski. voting. We're voting. Do you say yes or no? Who did he call? You. You. Oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't hear him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I approve. Sorry. <laughs> Tobitz? Yes. Bealey? Yes. Support. Berthold? Support. And Berg? Support. Motion passed with a unanimous vote. All right. Thank you, everybody, for working through that one. Or approve for your shed, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Our next item we have is a uh, accessory building, a dimensional variance on 239 Pearl Street. Jeremy, can you give any background on this? I have a couple questions, but maybe uh, you can enlighten me on some things there. Yep, um, so this came before the Planning Commission. Um, a, I believe I put it in there. Um, and Greg, maybe you'll remember. 
Um, they came before them, I want to say a month ago, a few months ago, before July. Um, and they, it's for the grasshopper. Um, so they're putting in an accessory building to have storage for their restaurant. Um, however, they had applied for a 10 foot um, building. And when the building inspector um, had the plans, he showed me that it was 16 foot. Um, and I believe Dave is here from the house fixers who can speak to that. Um, he wanted to, um, he had expressed to me that he wanted to do 16 feet so that way they could back a truck into it. Um, and the 10 foot would not be high enough. So maybe he could explain that a little better than I can. Um, Jeremy, um, clar clarify that that's the wall height. So the actual height as measured is more than that. It's the average between the peak and the eaves of the roof itself. The peak the is 24. The request would be for more than 16 feet. So the peak will be less than 25 foot. It works out to like 24 foot six inches, the very peak. Okay. One of my questions is: This is on the south side of Pearl Street. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that is a lot all by itself. So is that the lot that was fenced in, or the, what was fenced in with all kind of landscaped off there? Was that a couple lots that have been fenced in, or? No, that was one lot. That's the old right sign building used to set in that lot. Okay, because I just wanted, because of the, the diagram, it looked, it, that lot appeared to be kind of long and narrow, and the one that was fenced in was, wasn't long and narrow. Yeah, yeah, the, the one that's fenced in, I think there's two or three lots. It was at one time, and they're all combined, I think. For, for what it's worth, uh, as Jeremy pointed out, the Planning Commission approved this site plan at their June meeting. And so it, it was all set to go in terms of layout and everything like that. The only difference is the height of the building. Why is this considered an accessory building when it's not on the property of some other building? Good question. And it, could well, well given, be. given the fact that there's no room to put an accessory building on the Grasshopper restaurant lot, um, that's why he bought the old right side lot across the street. Because downtown, you did, there's just, you know as well as I do, there's no room for businesses to have any kind of outside storage. Mr. Chair, it seemed like the most logical way to, to view it. I mean, the other alternative would be to view it as a principal building on that lot. and. It's not really a principal building. It's not a principal use. It's accessory to the restaurant across the street. Okay, that was kind of my question of why it wasn't just considered a building, you know, like a primary building. Because when I think of an accessory building, I think there's a primary building, and now we're adding an additional building to the same lot. But that's not the case in this situation. No, if you were to think of it as a primary building, then the use wouldn't be allowed because warehouse isn't allowed use. Storage building isn't allowed use downtown. It has to be accessory to those restaurants. Okay. Uh, obviously, we have some the person here involved in this. Is there any other information you'd like to give us at this time? That's you, Dave. I didn't hear the question. Is there any other information you wanted to share? Oh no! Other than we just we just kind of wanted a 16 foot for inclement weather, back semis into um, obviously aluminum ramps get slippery, rain, snow, that kind of thing. Running a dolly down it with food stuff on it, it, it you know somebody's level get hurt, so we can back that back into the semi into the structure. Obviously, it'll, it'll be safer for everybody involved. That's that's why talking to the owner we opted to go to the 16 foot if we could make that happen, just for a safety thing. Commissioners, any questions from commissioners? Is there anyone else in here that wants to speak on this item before we go down through the uh, various uh, requests? Excuse me, does anyone know how tall the building at 247 is? It's going to loom over it or it's a little brick thing? Well, you know, 
it's a side street with yeah. semi industrial stuff. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to visualize it. Yeah. Okay, do we, uh, are we able to pull up the uh, finding of fact uh, on the camera, the written document, or I need to go read through it again? Cindy, I made you a co-host so you can share your screen. I'm not able to download the ZBA packet, so. You made who a co-host? Cindy. Oh, okay. Share the screen. I'm, sure. saying, I'm looking at the size of that building. Either one of you can. I've got it. Can you? Can I share? Yep. You should be able okay. to share some. So I don't know if you still want to read it or not, Mike. I don't yeah. really need to read it if everybody can see it okay. Okay. I'll give everybody a moment to peruse down through it and then we'll see if there's any questions. There is a number seven. I'll scroll down in a minute. As you're reading through, if you have a question, just go ahead and ask. And there's the uh, final item number seven. Right. Okay. Based on now, everybody's had a chance to look at this. Does anyone have any questions about the uh, what is written? If there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion. I would move that the, uh, considering that the findings of fact are all in the affirmative, that the uh, request for a variance be granted. Second. I support for that. We, we have a motion. We have support to accept the uh, request. Are there any questions on the motion? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Berthold. Support. Tobitz? Yes. Beely? Support. Dreyer? Yes. Berg? Support. And Kalaski? Support. Motion passed with a unanimous vote. All right, thank you. Uh, is there any other business that come before the zoning board at this time from anybody or any comments from anyone? I just want to say thank you. You're most welcome, sir. My only other comment, Mike, and it came up was, uh, it's now past history, but there was a concern, my concern, of firework stands that did not seek approval. Did mm -hmm. you get any information on that? Um, after that meeting, by that time, they had all pretty much cleared out. Um, we do have an idea of where they are, so we're gonna be vigilant on that next year. Um, and be watching for them very, very carefully. Um, I think the one that the that was at the hardware store next to Country Market, uh, Glenn did get out there while it was still in the parking lot and spoke to the property owners about that one. That was our concern, that, that site, because they never came to anybody. Right. Any other questions or comments uh, for the ZBA part of this Zoom meeting? No. If not, the uh, we'll adjourn this meeting and I assume all these other nice people and names are waiting for the planning commission meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Thank Mike. You.
Folks, we'll take about a two minute break and then Planning Commission will convene then. Folks, it looks like we have all the planning commissioners here. Uh, Jeremy, are you back? Not yet, apparently. Sorry, Mike, I'm back. Okay, very well. Folks, uh, for those of you that were there for the ZBA meeting, uh, we ask that you generally keep your microphone muted in, unless you need to speak. Uh, that cuts down on the uh, background noise and possible interruptions. Um, with that said, we'll call to order the August 4th meeting of the Adrian City Planning Commission. The first item on our agenda is consideration of the July 7th meeting minutes. Commissioners, I presume you've had an opportunity to review those minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to the July minutes? If there are none, we would entertain a motion for their approval as written. Motion to approve. Support. Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Is that unanimous by? Aye. aye. Okay, good. Minutes are approved. First item of business on our agenda is case number 20037, uh, site plan review for 239 Pearl Street. Um, Folks, as you may recall, we did the site plan review at our June meeting and approved it. Uh, subsequently, the uh, uh, applicant uh, revised their plans and uh, only in terms of height of the building. Uh, and they're now proposing a, was it 16 feet? Um, tw it's 24, I believe. 24, okay. Um, um, it's it's the average between 16 and 24. Okay, yeah. that's that's the exactly. Okay, um, at the meeting that just ended, the ZBA gave their approval for a variance that would permit that height. Um, there's actually um, it's well within the height limit of the B3 district, but the ordinance also calls for accessory buildings not to be any taller than 14 feet. Um, Part of me wonders if we even want to review this as a site plan because we already approved it. And if I understand Jeremy correctly, the only thing that's changed is the height of the building. Yes. You, you would just be modifying your prior approval to okay. allow for the greater height. Okay. Move to approve. And who was that? Watson. Watson, okay. Is there support for that motion? Support. 
Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the Planning Commission on this matter? Jeremy, I presume we did not receive any comments by phone or in writing or? No, sir. Okay. Commissioners, any additional discussion? Hearing none, we have a motion and support for uh, approval of the, re of the revised site plan. And we would call for a roll call vote then, Jeremy. Johnson. Support. Cotton. Yes. Gauss. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Tobitz. Yes. Love. Yes. Weatherby. Support. Watson. Support. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, that site plan is approved. Thank you next very item, much. Next on our agenda is case 20025, uh, 307 East Beecher, a rezoning application. Uh, this was tabled at the July meeting, and so so we could dis we can begin discussion of it. I would ask for a motion to remove it from the table. So moved. So table. And is there support for that motion? Support. Okay. All those in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, that's off the table. Um, you know, this is a, a request for a rezoning, and we have two requests for we have two requests for rezoning at this meeting. So give me just a minute to uh, review for both the commissioners and the audience our process for considering requests for rezoning. Um, the planning commission acts on these. However, any action taken by the planning commission is in the form of a recommendation to the city commission. The rezoning requires change in the city zoning ordinance, and that authority rests solely with the city commission. The criteria that we must use in making a recommendation regarding rezonings as specified by the city ordinance includes, includes specific areas for us to consider. Um, one, what identifiable conditions related to the application have changed and would therefore justify the proposed change in zoning? Would approving the change create any precedences by either approving or denying it? Uh, and what are the possible effects of those precedences? What is the impact to the ability of the city and other governmental units to provide adequate public services? Does the requested change negatively affect environmental conditions or the value of surrounding properties? What is the ability of the property in question to be put to a reasonable economic use as it is presently zoned? And these are the criteria that we need to consider uh, for any recommendation to be made. Um, we'll hear first from the petitioner or their representative and ask they give a brief overview of the request and their justification. We'll review any written or uh, documentations received from the public or any phone calls. Uh, we'll take any public comments from people in the audience. And we will uh, hear also from the city's planning staff. And once we've heard and considered the evidence, we may decide to render a recommendation this evening or possibly postpone action to receive further information. With that said, um, is there someone here that represents the uh, petitioner? I'm here, Don Lofton. Mr. Lofton, nice to see you again. You as well, sir. And uh, very briefly, give us a thumbnail sketch of what it is you're proposing to do here. So I'm proposing that at 307 East Beecher that we rezone the north portion of our parking lot to P1, um, um, B2. And your rationale for doing so? I'm trying to get this location for a provisioning center. Um, and and the the bottom line there is that a provision center cannot abut a residential property is that the issue that is correct sir okay questions commissioners for mr lofton jeremy did we receive any written or phone comments on this request no. that was a no i think no okay <laughs> um Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the Planning Commission on this particular matter? Hearing none, uh, we'll close the public hearing portion of this particular case and uh, I'll go to staff and uh, ask them to review their recommendations on this particular, on this particular rezoning request. 
Greg, you want to take that? Um, this is this is the reason I ask is this is a little different than this is the first time we've run into this, and this is the reason we tabled it at our last meeting. Uh, well, I, actually, at the last problem. meeting, the issue, the issue that arose was that there was a structure on this property, and in the parking district, you can't have a structure. And mm -hmm. so, since the time of your last meeting, and the and we talked at the last meeting about how. Uh, a conditional rezoning would be a possibility if the applicant proffered condition that uh, posed voluntarily that it be conditioned upon removal of that structure. This is a canopy from the old building that was the old building that was there extends into this area that would be parking district. Since that time, he has provided that in that written offer, but then I know also that. Uh, he applied for demolition permit to do the work to demolish it. I frankly don't know whether or not it's been demolished yet. Perhaps the applicant could tell us whether that's happened yet. Uh, no, sir, it has not been demolished yet. Okay, and so you would be uh, considering tonight the the offer for conditional rezoning. Uh, so rezoning to E1 conditioned upon removal of the the canopy uh, that currently occupies the portion of the lot. Uh, so Jeremy, I think, can review the, the findings. It's his report tonight. I didn't participate in drafting it, uh, but that was the it, we and we had done that last time. The, the, the obstacle that arose last time was the canopy, and so that has been addressed. Okay, thank you, commissioners. Uh, discussion. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for staff. Please go ahead. Uh, so upon approval, is there a requirement for them to submit a, a site plan for the for the parking lot? Uh, well, the site, I would anticipate that the site plan would be for the totality of the site, both the portion that's still B2 and the parking lot portion. Uh, and then the, the B2 use, the the dispensary on B2 will also be a zoning exception permit application. Gotcha. Okay, thanks, Greg. But if we're splitting the lots, wouldn't they need one for both, Greg? I think I think it can be combined into one site plan and there's no reason to have separate site plans. But it will have to address all the property. So the second lot to, I'd say, the parking district would have to meet any requirements. That section definitely is going to be screened. Um, I think I touched on that in the memo I sent. Yes, you did. Yep. I'm just concerned that this could open up other this it's creating kind of a loophole in our ordinance that, well, if I don't like what's next to me, I can buy it and put a parking lot there. And then I meet the requirements because I create the buffer zone. Um, maybe this won't ever happen again, but it certainly sets a precedent that we can't go back on. Ryan, that's, that's my concern too. On the other hand, we've, because when we set up when we set up the provision the ordinance for marijuana provisioning centers, we said we didn't want them next to residential property. And to reiterate Brian's point, if all you need to do is split off 20 feet and call it a parking lot uh, and have it resolved, then it kind of defeats our intention of the original ordinance. On the other well, hand, on the other like, hand, but Mike, hold on one second. But like, not even let's let's take the, this split out of the out of the equation. Mm -hmm. If somebody were to just buy the house next door, knock it down and request rezoning because I, I want more parking, that, that's where I'm worried. It's not so much the split, but it's like, okay, we can, this is a, this is an end around for things that, for anything. I mean, well, marijuana well, or well, let me, let me or that kind of thing. Greg? Let me uh, suggest a scenario that would be the wrong way to address this, and this has actually happened elsewhere. 
That is to, to split off a strip, not rezone it at all, split off the, the strip that abuts residential and transfer that into a straw man entity or give it to the neighbor. So now you've got a strip that's still zone B2 and your parcel does not abut residential and that strip could be one foot wide. That would be the wrong way to address it. I think, uh, as I said last time, this is an acceptable way to address it because they're creating a parcel that is large enough to functionally be a parking district parcel and be a parking lot. And parking districts in general, and our ordinance is the same, are set up with design requirements so that they are meant to be a transition between residential and non-residential uses. Well, this parcel is large enough to function like that. If it were different than this, if it were, as you say, a 20-foot strip, that would be another story. But does, when you evaluate a request for rezoning, you look to see whether or not it's a reasonable size parcel for the application of that zoning district to the parcel. And in this case, it is a large enough parcel that it makes sense. Well, and, and, and to support what Greg is saying, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not ashamed that we did this, but we have on a couple occasions, I think for a, a provisioning center just in the last 12 months said, well, gee, this corner of your property touches resident, touches residential property, you know, uh, change, the, change the shape of your lot by five feet and you're okay. It, it, didn't we do that with that uh, yes. West Maumee property? And the other side of the street, yes. Troy McLaughlin's property, it didn't end up getting developed, but no, that's but, exactly what happened. But that's exactly what happened. And, and I think I, I agree with, with uh, Mr. Elliott that this is, this is probably a preferable approach. Greg, this is Gordon. Um, how can this um, parking lot be used? Parking. As a parking lot. <laughs> so a public lot, anybody can go and park there? No. No, no it's private property still, but it can only be the use to which it can be put is a parking lot. I mean, it would be parking lot accessory. And, and these kind of districts are meant to be accessory parking for an adjoining business district. That's that's what they're set up for. Okay, so the space in the, this parking lot, is that, can that be used to account for the required parking for the provisioning center? Good. Okay. Was your, did you say it could, Greg? Yes. Yes. Uh, that doesn't seem to make sense to me because now you're having, you could have a car in the back and somebody walk out of the provisioning center with marijuana and now they're into a parking zone. So, I, well, so they can walk out of their house with marijuana too because yeah. it's legal well, in the state I, I, of Michigan. But right. it's like, I, I just want to take the, dis the discussion of what marijuana out of this. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, It's an end around that we've created, and I, I'm just concerned that we're going to set a precedent when, if this were to pass and go to the city commission and pass there, that well, I can buy a house, knock it down, and say I'm going to put a parking lot, and then I'm then I've created my buffer that I need. I, right or wrong, I don't think it's right, but that's the way it's written, and that's the way it can go. Brian, by the by the same token, uh, somebody could buy the house next door and ask for it to be rezoned to B2. Well, and, and those questions should be um, answered with reference to your master plan. And as we finish our new master plan and, and tighten things up, we'll be able to use it again in that way. But in this case, well, what we're really doing, and I think this is germane to this decision, is we're down zoning this land. This land's already zoned B2. It's mm -hmm. not like we're taking a residential parcel and rezoning it. 
We're asking for it to be down zone from a more intense use to a transitional use. Mm -hmm. I think that's a difference. Okay, commissioners, additional discussion? Well, my, the, my concern, Greg, is that uh, the, the surviving piece of property, but it's B2, when we go through a site plan, it ought, to, it ought to stand on its own with regards to parking requirements. I agree. Okay. Right. Although, um, you know, we, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure that's true. If, if a person comes to us and is, again, the, the marijuana aside, whether it's a vision center or not, maybe it's just a retail store, but uh, we say, gee, you don't have a, you know, your, your lot doesn't meet the par parking requirements or sufficient space for the parking requirements. And the petitioner says, yeah, but I own the lot next door and that's going to be the parking lot. Like, what's the problem? I don't yeah, see I mean, it, it would be appropriate for you to evaluate in the context of the zoning exception permit, the proximity of the dispensary yep. to the residential. And but the, the way parking districts are classically used are uh, in scenarios where, for example, you had a had lots fronting on a, on a major thoroughfare and those were all zoned commercial. And over time, they've become sort of obsolete functionally obsolete. They're not deep enough for the new uh, sorts of commercial uses that want to occupy them. And so that and what tends to happen is that the lots behind end up getting zoned to parking district. You don't want the commercial to creep into there, but parking allows you a transitional use. And that parking not only is, but must be accessory to the adjoining uh, commercial use. Anybody else? Let's take a look at the uh, uh, findings of fact. What identifiable conditions related to the application have changed, which justify the proposed amendment? Um, well, the proposal is to use this as a provisioning center, um, which would not be permitted as the property is currently configured. Um, Staff suggests that the P P1 parking district would be the optimum choice to buffer the uses with its requirement for screening of residential properties. Um, what are the precedences and the possible effects of such precedent, which might result in the approval or denial of this petition? Um, this is this is kind of the sticking point here and the one that uh, that we need to deal with. But uh, um, if we are to approve this or recommend approval to the city commission. Uh, I, it just does, does set the precedent that this is how we would deal with similar situations in the future. Um, I don't think, I don't believe there's any impact on the city's ability to provide services to this property as, as it, if it was zoned uh, P1. Um, and I don't anticipate any adverse environmental conditions uh, or effects on the surrounding property values. Um, and of course the property could be put to use as it's marketable as it currently sits as, as, as any number of B2 uses. Um, with that said, do we have a motion for action on this item? I move to approve the resolution. Support. We have a motion in support. And the motion would be to recommend to the city commission the change in zoning of this property from B2 to P1. Commissioner, right. additional discussion. Anyone? Okay. We have a motion and support for it. Um, I would suggest that uh, if we if we so chose to approve this as a recommendation to the city commission that we've done the findings of fact and that it would be within our authority to do so. That being said, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Otten? Yes. House? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Jacobitz? Yes. Love? Yes. Watson? 
No. Weatherby. Support. Johnson. Support. Motion passed seven to one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is 1105 East Beecher, a zoning exception application and site plan review for a marijuana growing facility. Is there someone here to speak to that particular project? I think we have 307 East Beecher next, don't we, Mr. I'm Fred? sorry, excuse me. Um, no, that's what we just did. 307 we just did is what 307. we just did. We I'm just sorry. Yeah, we're I'm at 1105. This is case 20032, 1105 East Beecher, zoning exception application and site plan review. Am I correct? Yes. You are correct. Okay. Is there someone in the audience that uh, represents the uh, petitioner here? And there is. You have John Macklich here. John, if you could very briefly tell us what it is you're proposing to do, give us a thumbnail sketch. Uh, this is a renovation of a small existing facility, uh, approximately 1,100 square foot. It's going to be a small Class A grow of four grow rooms in it. It's none of my business, but is that big enough to make it pay? <laughs> uh, for this location, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Um. Do you have plans in the future of this being a dispensary or a, a retail establishment? Uh, not at the current moment. There is uh, future plans to build out the rest of the footprint of that location, but right now it's all going to be a cultivation facility. Okay. Questions for the applicant, commissioners? When we consider a uh, zoning exception permit, um, we need to consider whether the proposal meets uh, the specific requirements for that use. Um, and we need to consider whether granting this application would have uh, any negative environmental impacts. Um, we need to decide whether this use is compatible with the surrounding uh, properties and is it consistent with the city's future land use plan? This property is in the east side uh, marijuana district. Staff has reviewed it and uh, has found in the affirmative for all of the criteria uh, relative to a zoning exception permit. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the planning commission on this particular matter? Jeremy, did we receive any written or phone calls relative to this proposal? No, we did not. Um, I would like to address the planning commission when I have, when you have a second. Oh, please go ahead. Um, so I think if you look at the packet, I kind of said, it's my assumption that they will eventually put a um, dispensary there. And I would like to reiterate to the applicant that if that is the case, this special use is not for a dispensary, so you will have to reapply again. Um, and that will bring your site plan forward. So if that's the case, um, I would implore you to say that that is what is going to happen there. Um, but other than that, I think the site plan and the site is fine. Um, the site's in pretty good shape, other than it could use a little bit of seal coating um, I discussed with their architect, added some more um, landscaping to beautify the spot. Um, they meet our clear vision um, on the corner. And um, I would like to see a photometric from them uh, to review um, because there is residential next to it that wasn't supplied. Um, and I'd like to also see uh, some fencing details to be sure that it's adequately fenced to screen them from them as well. Okay, tell you what, let's, let's deal first with the zoning exception permit, um, and we'll get to the site plan in just a second then. Um, commissioners, any discussion relative to the zoning exception permit? 
If there are none, we would entertain a motion for action on this particular application. Motion to approve. To support. Support. That was from Krista Cotton and Bob Love. Again, this is relative to uh, approval of the zoning exception permit. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Johnson? Support. Watson? Support. Weatherby? Support. Cotton? Yes. Gauss? Yes. Taylor? Support. Jacobitz? Yes. Love? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Then taking a look at the site plan, I think Jeremy actually already addressed the, the concerns. Um, relative to, um, we need to have the final site plan show the locations and enclosure for the dumpster. Um, need to have the parking lot improved in terms of resealing. Um, and we need to have a photometric plan showing where the lighting and how it's going to impact uh, potential impact on any neighboring properties. Sir, we're good with that. John, you still there? Yeah, sorry, I had you on mute. Yeah, that's fine on our end. We'll get that to you shortly. Okay. Commissioners, any discussion relative to the site plan? If there's no additional discussion, uh, we would entertain a motion for conditional approval of the site plan with the stipulations being uh, that the parking lot would be rese uh, resealed, that the site plan and the site itself will show the dumpster and enclosure, and um, and that will staff will review a photometric plan. We, we would like to see um, an odor control plan and maybe Greg can jump in on that. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I meant to mention that as well, too. We need to know. It, it's one of the ones that the city's still trying to work that out. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, Greg, if you want to jump in on that, but odor control plan is something we've been trying um, to add into these. Um, fire flow testing it should just be standard. They should be submitting that to Eric. Um, I so I believe that's something he wanted. Well, in the order, what we've been doing with the outer control plan is having them represent to us what their plan is. An applicant should describe what their process is uh, right now if they haven't submitted that in writing, and and then uh, uh, they can follow up and and provide a writing that is consistent with their description of the odor control protocols that they're going to give you tonight. Uh, and then they're on record. Uh, that's sort of the minimum. You know, we may come up with standards later that will be more strict than that, but at least we know uh, they've thought about it, they've planned to address it. I would point out also on the other uh, point that they cannot, they will not be able to have a provisioning center on this site uh, because it abuts, I believe it abuts residential, uh, if it abuts residential. It, according to the review, it does. Uh -huh. uh, they won't be able to have a provisioning center on the site. Um, you know, and so we know that it's only going to be a grow, grow and process, and or process. Okay, and just to add to that, the ordinance does specify that any grow facility will not, that, that both the noise and the odor will not be detectable at adjacent properties. And I think what Mr. Allen is saying is we need to know, we need to know how you're going to accomplish that. So again, uh, we have a motion. Did we have a motion? No. Okay. We need a motion for uh, approval of the site plan, a conditional approval of the site plan with the stipulations that we just outlined. Move to approve a stipulation. Mr. Watson Pardon. and Mr. Taylor, thank you. Any additional discussion? <clears throat> Jeremy, a roll call vote if you don't mind. Gauss? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Sovitz? Yes. Love? Yes. Weatherby? Support. Johnson? Support. Watson? Support. 
Totten? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Thank you, sir. Best of luck with that. Uh, folks, our next case, case 20033 for 115 East Santa Heights Drive is also a uh, rezoning application from R4 to B2. Um, I've already reviewed our criteria in our process for considering rezonings. Is there someone in the audience to address the Planning Commission on this particular proposal? Hello? Anybody? Mike Nicklowitz should be here. Um, yeah. Um, there you go. Oh, Mike, is that you? Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't yes. see you. That, that's okay. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, I helped um, the owner of the restaurant put together uh, a site plan. The concept was that he wanted to acquire the, or he did acquire the property next door to him uh, to the east and he needed additional parking for um, his restaurant. And so um, I put together the drawing package that shows what he could potentially do with the parking. Um, I know his long-term intent is to remove that home that's on the site and um, take over the whole lot. Um, he did mention to me that he wanted to phase the drawings Put together as though we were phasing the parking lot um, initially he would leave the house up and get uh, I, I don't have the drawings in front of me but get um, about uh, 15 or 16 parking spaces in there and then complete the lot when he removes the house um, so that he can have uh, through traffic from um, Sienna Heights to uh, the uh, adjacent street You know, I, I have to say, I, I don't have any real problem with the request for rezoning. Uh, we've never seen a site plan for this particular project. Um, and that's, that's kind of water under the bridge at this point. But it, 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 we're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm getting ahead of ourselves uh, here a little bit. But, you know, when you're talking about number of parking spaces, well, gee, we, we don't know that this lot will hold sufficient parking as required for a restaurant like this. Um, but I guess that's neither here nor there. That This should have been done in a site plan for the whole property um, from the, you know, before construction was even started. Um, My question, Mike, is why are we, I mean, this is a parking lot. This is what that ordinance, the previous one we discussed, is intended for. Why are we going to B2 and not just doing a parking lot? Well, because if he, if he wants to keep the house on it and maybe rent it out, that wouldn't be permitted in a parking district. Is one reason. Yeah, that's, that's right, Mr. Chair. Our discussions with him uh, initially were to recommend parking district back here. Uh, but as you point out, um, he did that uh, the same issue that arose with uh, Mr. Lofton's proposal would have arisen here uh, because he uh, doesn't feel like he can financially handle demolishing the house right now. And so the way for him to attempt to move forward and be able to have some parking on that parcel uh, in the interim until he's able to take the house down is to go with uh, B2. B2 is, if you look up and down the street um, in other blocks, B2 does extend this far into blocks to the south of here. So it's not like the, it's not unprecedented in terms of the extent of the zoning district all, along this stretch of Maine. Uh, but, you know, would, would parking district be better? Yes. It would it would be better, but it would require him to uh, commit to demolishing the house. She wasn't able, didn't feel like he was able to commit. And, and as the chair points out, you know, there is an issue here with no parking. Uh, 
Uh, it's the case that uh, fire zoning administrator allowed this to proceed, whereas it probably should have gone through site plan review. And two city administrators prior gave him a letter indicating that he could use the parking in the public park across the street for his business purposes. You know, neither of those things were very good ideas, but now we're left with a situation where we have a substantially completed, you know, very nicely remodeled uh, uh, structure that uh, is almost ready to open, but doesn't really have any functional parking available. Commissioners, discussion? Questions for the applicant? Jeremy, did we receive any written or phone call, written comments or phone calls on this proposal? No, Mr. Chair, we did not. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the Planning Commission on this proposed change in zoning? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing, hearing portion of this particular issue and go to commissioner discussion. To uh, kind of back up what uh, Mr. Elliott already said, and, and that's that, gee, this is, this is a beautiful looking project. And, and we've, on a number of counts, uh, the ball has been dropped in terms of, of how this should have been handled, but that's this is where we are now, and I would I would personally hate to see it not be able to go forward because of a lack of parking. And I think that the proposal to be to, to changing that property to be two doesn't change the character of the neighborhood significantly. Um, it has little environmental impact, uh, not no environmental impact. Um, in fact, you know, we're just, we're making this B2 property that faces on Main Street a little bigger and with a dog leg. Um, Are they combining those two lots? Not necessarily, no. But in terms of functionally, that's what we're doing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, they, they do refer to that. Staff refers to that by saying, uh, economically speaking, the combining of the parcels would be more beneficial. So there's no reason why they couldn't do that, right? Right, right. Okay, yeah. I was, I was under the impression from the applicant that they were, when I spoke to him on the phone uh, most recently, that he was wanting to tear the house down and combine those lots. Right. Um, I just read somewhere, too, where it said it'd be more tax beneficial to the city to have it as one lot. Well, no, I, I think what it says is it'd be more beneficial if it was zoned for business, but, oh, no, you're right, Brian, excuse me. I'd like that in the notes that he said I was right. <laughs> Highlighted, underlined, bolded. In red. Any other discussion, commissioners? Really, you couldn't put a business on this lot because it's too small. Right. Right, Greg? Um, well, the house exists. So if he, you know, the one implication of this is if he wanted to have a business in that lot, in that house, um, that would be allowable. But again, only if he could require, provide the required off street parking, he isn't going to be able to. Mm -hmm. But what I'm asking is he couldn't knock it down. It's too small to put a new building on and meet all the requirements of setbacks and parking. Uh, I would think that would be true. Could be one of those drive-through film processing places. Don't, don't suggest drive-through. What are you, what are you uh, talking about? No, never mind. Mean. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, findings of fact, like I said, uh, we've kind of reviewed these already. Um, what change? What uh, what circumstances have changed? Uh, the property at 1018 North Main Street is in need of parking in. This rezoning would allow the combination of lots for parking needs. Um, does this create any precedences or possible uh, uh, effects of such precedences? I don't see any. Uh, 
these this is already adjacent to B2. Uh, it's not spot zoning. Um, they will need to, I, I presume that we will do a site plan for this parking lot at some point, uh, at which time we could address any storm sewer or screening issues uh, between this and the adjacent residential property. Um, but I don't see any uh, adverse environmental effects by changing this to B2. Um, the property could be put to, to good use as a residential property, but uh, probably is a higher and best use as, as, as is being proposed. Um, if we so chose, I would say that uh, uh, we could recommend to the city commission the change in this zoning from R4 to B2 and would entertain a motion to that effect. Anybody? So moved. Mr. Taylor, thank you. Support. And support was from Mr. Johnson, I believe. Commissioners, any additional discussion? If there is none, uh, a roll call vote, please. Watson. Support. Johnson. Support. Cotton. Yes. Gauss. Yes. Taylor. Support. Jacobitz. Yes. Love. Yes. And Weatherby. Support. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, very well. Thank you for joining us, Mike. Um, accessory buildings is the next item on our agenda. Uh, Jeremy has provided uh, a draft, not a draft per se, in fact, it's on the screen, I see, of, uh, I, was, I find this a little frustrating when it's shared, and I'm trying to scroll the share, and that doesn't work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeremy, you want to uh, walk us through what we're looking at here? Just tell oh, me where you need me to go, guys. You're, you're fine where you're at. Um, over the past couple ZBA meetings we've had, and, and this was in the last one too, we've had multiple um, sheds come before us that are over 100 square feet. Um, it seems as though they were never being brought to the ZBA. I don't know if that's the case or not. I'm not going to um, why that um, but we are starting to see them and if you drive down um, past Myers and Lowe's and all those you're going to see these sheds sitting out um, and I think that's where a lot of these are coming from and why they're uh, the sizes that they are so I tried to do a little bit of research um, the ZBA requested that we look at this um, one that I you know so I, I provided you with a memo um, kind of explaining why we why I looked at Fairfax and why I think that I like their setup. Um, and Fairfax, Virginia, they kind of classify it two different ways. They classify it as a shed and as a storage building. We currently only use sheds. On a property, you can have an attached garage, a detached garage, and another shed, which is a little ridiculous. So the, the guy in the ZBA meeting that did not like that um, shed and he called it a garage, which rightfully so, it, it could be. Um, but we don't classify it that way. Um, in Virginia, the way that they did it is they classified it as a storage shed, which they do as 250 square feet, which I find possibly a bit big. Um, they also do have, um, if you look at, Michelle, if you'll go down a little bit. The, keep, keep going to the next one. A little bit more, right there. So they, oh, go back. So they kind of, while well, she's going back to that section, um, they kind of show up a little bit, <laughs> Michelle. The spot right above 46, that section, right there. There, there we go. Um, so they kind of show a little bit of a calculation. And what I want to do is a calculation. Um, so we have our R1 through R4 lots. R1 lots are bigger. R4 lots are smaller. So allowing a 250 square foot structure on an R4 lot is ridiculous. Um, allowing a second garage in that is even more ridiculous. 
Um, in this, they kind of, th this is their handout. This isn't their ordinance by any means, but we can kind of look at the R1, which is a larger lot as the guy in the ZBA did it. I don't know how many of you were there, but as that is, he could have a larger shed and it not affect his total area for the 30% that he can have. If it's an R4, it's a different story. Um, whether we want to keep bringing these to the ZBA is up to you. Um, I'm more than willing to write something for you to consider that we can use a percentage um, for different lots to try to mitigate this from having to be a $150 fee to residents to get a, a shed put on their property. Um, and really, this is up for discussion. It's up for you to look at your thoughts, um, and I can get you something next meeting if you'd want. Jeremy, I, I, I like the concept of uh, that, uh, that, that this or, or that this handout shows. Um, I also liked the fact that they address uh, uh, Quonset huts and hoop houses and mm -hmm. temporary garages and things like that, too, because that, that's a... Uh, uh, you love the Quonset hut. Well, it, it's a, it, it's not just that. It's also we've we've got we've got dozens and dozens of tent garages in town, uh, which a don't look good, and b I think they're a health and safety at, a hazard. If there's a big wind, that thing is going to blow away. Um, and, and there goes the dog. Excuse me. Continue the discussion. I'll be right back. Take take over, Commissioner Watson. Wow, that's a lot of responsibility. Um, I do like this thirty percent thing, but I do feel like we need them to come to the city so the building inspector or somebody can go out and say, "Yes, it can be placed here." Yeah. Um, that's kind of my concern, you know. It needs to be, you know, setbacks are different in all areas. Everybody thinks they can, and the, the people out there will be like, oh, yeah, sure, we can do that. No problem. We'll plop it right there. Yeah, you don't know where your property line is. Next thing you know, you got it sitting halfway on your neighbor's yard, and then they get pissed. It, mm -hmm. We need some mechanism for this to be monitored because it is getting out of control, isn't it? But it's just, it's become the hot thing. Um, we do uh, require a zone of compliance review for any uh, shed of whatever size. And then uh, building code, I want to say it's 120 square feet. If a structure is larger than that, uh, it requires a building permit as well. No matter how, how often, no matter if it's pre built or not, it requires a building permit, correct? If, if it's above that size. And our building official does like to make sure things are adequately secured to the ground too. So it wouldn't be unreasonable for him to go check on these as well. We'd prefer that. Honestly, I think he would too. Yeah, I for one think we need to tighten this up as well. I, uh, I have a neighbor who, uh, I don't know whether he went through the process or not, but uh, put a certainly a large um, storage shed on this property. It's it's attractive, but I'm not sure that he followed the regulations, and I'm not sure that uh, he took out a permit and had it inspected. But anyway, in any event, I think we definitely need to have some better guidelines, and I'm in support of all this uh, that you're proposing, Jeremy. Okay. Jeremy, I, I would be happy to bring uh, something to you guys to consider next next month. Um, if, if the Virginia one looks good, I actually really like how they have um, their calculations. So I would try to piggyback off that um, and bring you something and we can hopefully pass it, if not modify it and get it pushed through. So one, other, one other thing I think we need to address too and think about is, you know, people put a pool in, they want to put a cabana, you know, that though it doesn't have four walls and a door, it's still a structure on your property. Mm -hmm. So do you get, you know, 
a 10 by 10 is free and then you can put up an, another structure or what would the what would, would the process be there? Would because that would be such a rare occasion, do we want to keep that as a ZBA requirement? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. That's just, you know, that, that to think about. Yeah. Okay. I mean, my friend just put a pool in out in the township and the next thing you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's a little far from the house. We need somewhere to sit under. <laughs> and you got to put up a, you know, mm. four posts and a roof on it. It looks nice. It's, you know, built soundly, but you know, like you said, people throw up those blue tarp sheds you can buy at Walmart to cover up their old car. That's got six years of trash in it. I mean, We want something with teeth that, you know, we're taking the view that we need to clean stuff up around the city. We need something with teeth. Yep. Yeah. Understood. Jeremy, does that give you enough direction to? Yeah, I okay. think I can have something for you next month that you will be happy with. Okay, very good. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Folks, the next item on our agenda, uh, I'm not familiar with this, but uh, we have a, supposedly a presentation by the Crime Prevention um, Crime Prevention through Environmental Design. Is that correct? And do we have someone from that organization here? Identify yourself, if you would. That's me. I'm Harmony Gamazel, educator with MSU Extension. Oh. Hey, Harmony. Welcome. Hey, Harmony. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good to be here. And I do have some uh, slides to show you. So uh, you may or may not know that the Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design Project has been happening since December. Uh, we kicked it off uh, with a public workshop, and I'm just here to give you an update tonight uh, and also an invitation to a special event happening later on this month. So if you have about five to eight minutes of time. I certainly appreciate you putting me on the agenda tonight. And I will start. So Adrian Safe Neighborhoods uh, is the name of the project and it is a partnership uh, with MSU School of Planning, Design and Construction, also MSU Extension, the Charette Institute at MSU and the City of Adrian, and it started with the DDA. Uh, I want to thank the steering committee that's been helping this, this project uh, for the last few months uh, since the winter. Uh, Dusty Steele from the DDA, uh, from the police department, and uh, Greg Elliott, of course, uh, from City Hall. Uh, we have started to, I, I should say, we're implementing the DDA's new strategic plan that came out of a 2019 process. Uh, looking at crime prevention through environmental design was a goal uh, in that strategic plan. And so that is where this effort uh, began. And it naturally became a partnership with the police department and city hall. The purpose is of doing CEPTED, we call it CP, TED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, is just to affect really change in the city for public health, safety, and welfare, and that's through improved environmental design, reasonable levels of policing, and increased community engagement, and this project does help with all of that. So what we let SEPTED, uh, we've added placemaking to that. So uh, we like to identify and preserve great places in the city already, create them if they need to be created, and then address crime through changes to our streetscapes, yards, sidewalks and alleyways, roadways, lighting, landscaping, access around town, etc. So there's lots of ways to reduce crime through changes to the environment and also to preserve great places. So I'll give you a really quick summary of what that is. It involves four elements. That is surveillance, accessibility, territoriality, and quality environments. These are all things that SEPTED strives for. Uh, increased surveillance on the street, eyes on the street. Are people actually there at all hours of the day and evening to detect suspicious activities? Are there good lines of sight down each roadway and across houses and yards and things like that between businesses? That means a lot. Then accessibility 
how do we attract people and vehicles to where we would like them to be to where they want to go versus restricting accessibility to potential criminal offenders. Uh, and then the territoriality is very important because a sense of ownership on our properties throughout the city is critical uh, in reducing crime. If, if a potential offender uh, looks at a property that has some sense of ownership to it, like it's being cared for, and well-maintained quality environment, they are more likely to move on uh, and not bother with that property. So these are four elements of SEPTED. Some examples here of surveillance ideas. In the upper left, same parking lot, but it's before and after uh, improved lighting. And so you see in the after shot, no shadows, uh, much more of a SEPTED uh, type design. Cameras, of course, are a big element of, of SEPTED for surveillance as well. And then storefronts. Um, at the very bottom, you see examples of windows and doors on a storefront that are blocked by signs. And this is really not SEPTED. What we like to see is what's on the right, which are the, the windows and the eyes on the street and the eyes uh, looking in from the street are very much more clear and allows for um, the surveillance to occur better. Some more examples of just lighting, clearing out shrubbery, night lighting, um, cameras you see at the doorbell, just all these little, very affordable things to do for surveillance that really help with SEPTED. And these can be on public property and private property. I do see that I'm getting a, an unstable internet connection. If I do drop off, I will be back on. Just give me a moment, I apologize. Um, again, more about surveillance. We just want to increase odds of better observation. This is the same car in three different pictures under different lighting. And you can see how it would be very difficult to tell what the real color was of the car at night just based on the lighting around it. But the one in the middle, that type of lighting is what we prefer for SEPTED because you can actually see at true colors and there's less shadow, much more safe. Uh, looking inside of a store for surveillance changes. This is quite interesting because you see in the upper left, a store with the, you see those gray shaded boxes are actually tall shelving units that block sight lines. Even across the front window there, you can see that between the cold store and door A, uh, they've blocked the window. And then the cash register is up in the upper left corner and those sight lines are blocked and they can't see what's happening in other areas. Now, if you just institute some very cheap, easy septed elements, you move that shelving around, you move the register and you in, in put some mirrors in and maybe a camera, you have much more uh, increased surveillance and a much safer environment for the workers and the visitors. Sight lines, again, a little bit more on that, clearing out landscaping and shrubbery, clear sight lines. You can see that photo, that, that drawing in the middle where the bicyclist and the person on the porch can easily see out the road and through the yard because landscaping is trimmed in such a way to allow those sight lines and then they have some lighting. And then look at the different types of fencing in the lower left pictures. Same person walking their dog along. Uh, can or cannot see a person entering or exiting a window illicitly. So depending on the types of fencing that you see in the city, uh, it can actually be more safe and reduce crime if you can see better. Now accessibility, we wanna make offenders, criminal offenders feel like it is way too risky for them to commit a crime here, anywhere in the city. So we wanna limit their free access to properties, to neighborhoods and to our downtowns. We do that through various designs in signage, landscaping, locks of course are very easy, fencing. You can see a picture here of just minimal speed bumps. Um, you can do, there's such a wide range of accessibility design changes you can make in the city uh, and on private property to help uh, minimize um, criminals accessibility to your property. Even the way you see in this middle picture of someone able to climb up on a fence over a roof and get into a TV and, and, and burglarize. So little things like that. And so we're looking at a lot of that. And then just the way places are landscaped, this picture in the lower left has a great sight line. Feel very safe there. The lighting is probably very good at night. Uh, and so this is a much more septed designed place. 
and then signage always where are you what's coming up what's around you this is always great and it's for territoriality too uh, to show that um, people do live here and care about the place and you can do that in all sorts of ways through art decoration landscaping planting signage um, from very uh, zero cost type ways to do this to more expensive ways but again Building that sense of community and territoriality, that sense of ownership and someone is caring about the place can really do a lot to reduce crime. Even the smallest holiday displays in a yard can deter crime, uh, burglaries and larcenies, because they're more likely to move on to a property that doesn't have this much uh, care taken. And uh, it does make a, a difference. Quality environments, again, just maintaining streets, sidewalks, alleyways, trails, and facades can do a lot to reduce crime. And that can be from very cheap changes uh, to, to our properties to uh, more expensive planned out changes. So we add placemaking to this SEPTED theory in planning uh, because placemaking itself is transformational. It is also having to do with changes to our built environment, just like SEPTED and creating community. And so uh, pl placemaking is generally making changes to an environment or bringing new activities uh, to it. Like here's a, a community painting project, uh, arts and murals, places to interact. This is pre-COVID. So we have to rethink what placemaking will look like in 20 and 2021. But again, placemaking, there's three different types, really. There's tactical, which is very low cost, low effort, lots of fun, like board games on the sidewalk you see here, very easy, but again, attracts people. And that in, a, in of and of itself is septed, right? You're reducing crime, you're putting more surveillance on the street, and you're creating a great place. There's creative placemaking, which is where you always incorporate arts, theater, and music into a place and then strategic which is larger budget like you see the housing infill here on the right uh, requires more longer term funding and planning of course you can combine all three of these um, you can also do them uh, singularly and again these place making efforts no matter what level you do them at also reduce crime while creating great places so what do we hope to accomplish and what are we accomplishing with the safe neighborhoods project well, we're looking at this summer unveiling policies, policy recommendations that do reduce crime and increase that sense of place, promote circulation for vehicles and pedestrians in a way that inhibits crime uh, uh, during all hours uh, throughout the city and in our neighborhoods, just promoting public safety through quality environmental design, looking at existing planning efforts, leveraging those resources into future SEPTED activities, uh, I have met with uh, Joe and Sri from Giffels Webster who are working on your master plan update and I'm sharing data with them and updates and they hope to incorporate all this engagement and policy recommendations into the uh, new plan update as well. So we're great to have that synergy and build on that synergy. Uh, also looking at the cultural assets you have in Adrian and trying to create those, uh, preserve authentic neighborhood features uh, uh, in a way and also the DDA is involved we cannot forget and their whole goal is to support existing businesses and create opportunities for new ones and that involves doing every little bit we can to um, create the public feeling that it is safe to come downtown uh, and do business and for leisure uh, and to live there and so this is why it's so important to the DDA is a is a is a as a big partner for this SEPTED project um, the policies uh, that are going to come out of the work, and I'll get into what that means in a little bit, we want to make sure that they are achievable. So we're going to identify ways, and when I say we, it's um, uh, two folks, faculty members at MSU and myself, just to recommend SEPTED techniques to the city at the end of this month uh, in ways that can reduce crime that are low cost and high impact. And then identify resources that residents, renters, landowners, and the city can access to make changes and move forward and identify some place making opportunities. How are we doing that? How are we going to come up with those recommendations? Well, we have, with the help of Vince at the police department and uh, his staff, we have uh, mapped out the crime data for the city between the years of 28, uh, 2016, 17, 18, 19. So we can see crime trends for both violent crime and property crime. 
overlay that crime map, uh, those crime mapping trends with a geographic analysis of the city and its neighborhoods. And then you can start to see where there are hot spots of crime. And then what are the changes to the environment that could be made uh, to reduce that crime eventually. So that's the crime data, the data piece of it. The public engagement piece that has been going on, and if you've been involved with us on Facebook, you've been asked many times to complete our survey and take part in the Photo Voice um, project. Um, but we are doing pretty well in collecting survey information from residents about their sense of personal safety in the city, uh, policing, neighborliness, placemaking, and they can actually identify geographically a place in the city where they don't feel safe and a place where they do feel safe and explain why. So these surveys have been very important. Um, I was just given the news today that we are extending the deadline for the surveys from July 31st when it ended to all the way to August 22nd, which is super. I learned that the MSU team can take survey results all the way up to right before our online showcase that I'll get to in a minute. So we're excited to keep collecting people's opinions about this topic online. Uh, and then photo voice, which is uh, submit two photos online. And we have a quick link for that. Submit a photo of something you're grateful for in your neighborhood with the built environment, something you're not grateful for and explain why, right? Create a photo essay. And from that, we are creating an online photo voice gallery uh, to tell the stories across our neighborhoods uh, about, the, about this issue. And then finally, MSU team is developing policy recommendations based on this data, based on the engagement. This is the timeline, just briefly. I'm not going to go all the way through this uh, in the past. Um, but I'll point out that second from the bottom, August 24th through the 28th is a week-long virtual showcase at our website. Uh, and then we will be posting videos and things like that of all of the findings and interesting things we've come across along the way. And then we're hosting a leadership roundtable Thursday, August 27th from 4 to 6.30. This is online, hosted by MSU and myself. And we hope to have many of you uh, there at this roundtable. If you could please save the date. We will be um, presenting the findings and recommendations of all of this work uh, in a live presentation. On Zoom. And then we will do breakouts with all of the leadership from around the city uh, to get feedback and some ideas for next steps. Uh, and so the project does end in September, but Adrian is part of a what we call a cohort with the cities of Albion and Howell, who are also going through the same safe neighborhoods process and really helping uh, with this cohort uh, to provide feedback on a statewide guidebook on planning for SEPTED. And that would be something in 2021, which is really exciting. And so again, save August 22nd, I'm sorry, August 27th from 4 to 6.30 for a Zoom leader roundtable. Please visit our website. Um, the address is at the bottom and I will put it in the chat before I leave tonight. Um, but it does have everything you need. It'll have all the updates, all the videos as we get into August. You can take the survey here and submit your photos. I do have to get that July 31st deadline off of there because it's now August 22nd. Um, but um, please, please visit the website. We can learn about SEPTED, learn about Photo Voice, and there's a little bit about the showcase on there, but we're still populating this website and it's been, it's been really helpful to be able to share it. We are on Facebook and thanks to Michelle for always sharing and forwarding our posts um, through the city Facebook pages. Um, but we are just at Adrian Safe Neighborhoods and pretty much we use this as a place to push the survey, push photo voice, and we will be definitely posting videos and links during that online showcase week starting the 24th. So please find us. The Photo Voice Gallery, a gallery looks like in person. People actually talking about the photos that they took of their neighborhood and why it's important to them with, with leadership visiting every photographer and hearing the stories firsthand. I'm sorry we can't do that uh, this summer, um, but we will be replicating this online with PowerPoints and uh, essays and photos. So you'll see that at our website as well. And again, we're still collecting photos 
uh, and essays. Uh, so please, everyone on this call and beyond are, are invited uh, to submit photos. So four things I leave you with. I'm done now, uh, but take the survey, please. Get two photos with a story at the Photo Voice link. Save the week of August 24th to watch those presentations at our website and then and to visit the photo gallery. And then please save August 27th, 4 to 6.30 p.m. for that leadership roundtable uh, to, um, to wrap up this project and start the conversations about what's next. Everything you need, again, is at that Google website we've created for this project. Again, I'll put it in the chat. The public is invited to the leadership roundtable. Um, uh, public will um, be able to view the live presentation, hear everything that we're presenting, and then go off into their into a separate breakout room while different leadership uh, folks go into their separate breakout rooms to discuss what they've heard and what next steps they would like to take. And then everybody comes back together at the end uh, to hear what one another has said in the room. So that's kind of what that round table is going to look like. Um, and then please, I leave you with each one ask one, please ask a fellow leader to uh, attend this with you, uh, at least one person, right? And uh, we definitely want to spread the word about this round table. And, uh, and I've asked, I have asked Joe and Cherie from Biffles Webster to be uh, there at the round table. Hopefully they can attend and, uh, and, and that'll help inc them incorporate this into your master plan update. So I believe that's all I have have and I just want to thank you again for your time so that you have had a busy uh, busy agenda so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to get that website link into the chat so I can take questions but thanks again Michelle thank you I mean Harmony excuse me Harmony thank you very much uh, are there any questions for her Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Folks, um, thank you. Jeremy, are we set for the 13th for a uh, meeting with our comprehensive plan consultants? So we wanted to, to check with you all. There, there were some folks who could make the 27th and not the 13th and some folks that could make the 13th and not the 27th. Uh, so uh, we hope to decide on one date or the other tonight. Hopefully Giffel still has the 13th open. Um, but it seems to, his schedule fills up pretty fast, but those are the dates that they gave us as uh, last week when we talked to them as being available. Okay, I, I can only speak for myself and possibly Commissioner Weatherby. I, we, we will be in the uh, Q&A on the 27th with almost guaranteed no cell reception <laughs> and certainly no internet. So I can confirm that. I was just there this week. The phones do not work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's amazing. Yeah. Are, uh, are we all uh, interested in confirming the 13th then if, if they're still available for that date? Sure. Please. Please. Yeah, either date works for me, so I don't... Either works for me. We'll yeah, I just, lock that up. I just won't be here the 13th. Who, who was that? Bob, was that you? Um, yeah. Okay. I'm not planning to be here on the 13th either. Well, <laughs> okay. If I have a radical change in plans, I could make it happen on the 13th, but I'd rather not. Okay. Um, it will be a virtual meeting. Yes. And we will record it. Okay. Um, what, what, what time? Do we know yet? Uh, well, I think that's open to discussion. Uh, if we want to try to move it up, um, we'd, you know, I, I think the assumption was that it would be an evening meeting, but uh, we could try to move it out if that was something I, you were interested in. I, I've got I've got a conflict. I've got a, another board meeting at five o'clock that same day that I will make sure I'm done with by seven. So right. that would make sense, I think. All right, we'll try to do the thirteenth to seven. Okay. 
we'll let you know this week. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before us this evening? Michelle Dewey, thank you for hosting. Mayor Heath, thank you for joining oh, us. I'm sorry. I thought you'd have it open to the public period. Well, that's what I just said. Is there any other business? Is, I'm is sorry, I'd want to introduce myself. I'm Angie Verner and um, involved with the uh, old Garfield property on Cross Street. Um, an article was put out in the paper, which kind of made me get ahead of myself because I really didn't want to come in until I knew uh, we were going to have the property. Um, I just wanted to come and say hello and maybe get an idea for how you feel about uh, the use we would want to do for the property because it would require a zoning change. Um, right now we operate MH Pump on Winter Street that zone light industrial. I don't take up too much of your time. I know it's late, but and so that would be kind of what I'm looking to do there. We would just be doing the same business there that we do on Winter Street and keeping the Winter Street location. It's a wholesale supply house. We don't have a lot of traffic. Uh, the Garfield property with traffic that comes in off Main Street or Winter Street would make it so hardly anyone would be using the cross street traffic. Um, we're in a residential area now, the same area, so that was Ms. Furman, well, is the is the Garfield property adjacent in abutting your current property? Um do they connect? No. I mean um, if the railroad track wasn't there, they would connect in the the northwest corner. Mm -hmm. But the railroad track runs between them. But Mr. Chair, both the railroad track and the uh, uh the path of the new uh Trail. trail extension both uh, separate bisect the property okay. Okay. on one side from the other. I, you know, on on one hand, we're glad to see that property developed, but for one, I, I uh, really can't give any kind of opinion until I would see you know some kind of development plan or something like that. Uh, Not, I'm not in a position to say, oh yes, please rush ahead with that, or that's a great idea. Uh, I would need to have a lot more information. Yeah, speaking from myself, you know, you say you're currently on an industrial piece. You know, once we change that to whatever you need it to be, it's like that forever, even if you go away. So, you know, we need a plan that says this is what we're gonna do, but There's there's lots of ifs involved in yeah, this, and, and you probably already know this. You you need to be working with uh, uh, Jeremy Clement or Mr. Elliott at City Hall, in uh, to get something on our agenda that way. Right, uh -huh. Jeremy and I have spoke a little bit, and okay. he suggested I come here as a um, way to just introduce. Unfortunately, oh. the article put it out there without <laughs> me having done any planning and I did not talk to them or want anything printed yeah. at the time yeah. but obviously they're doing their job um well and I, that, that doesn't I don't think it influences us one way or the other I wouldn't be too concerned with that uh but I just uh, uh we're, we're glad to hear from you uh and I'm glad to know there's interest in the property um like I said I until we would have more more specifics I can't really offer an opinion though I didn't, I didn't think that we should offer an opinion. I wanted her to kind of, the paper kind of put it in a weird way where it seemed as though it was already gone through. Mm -hmm. um, and ju just to be sure, you know, how the feeling is, I want to see how, how we feel about it. And, you know, I kind of explained to her that there, there's been opposition to the senior housing we've had, to the um, workforce housing we've had. And I don't know how, warehousing would feel in that location. Um, but, you know, I can't stop a petitioner from coming through. So I wanted her to at least, you know, give us a bit of information. And you know, if she still feels she wants to, this could potentially come in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, so sure. I thought, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I just thought it would be good for her to, you know, 
public comment, oh. just air piece, and then we can go from there. And we appreciate that. It, it, it's good to hear. Fair, from you. This again would be a situation where we would want to seek guidance from our master plan, where uh, rezoning is requested. Uh, unfortunately, our old plan, because this was a school site, just assumed it would be a school site forever and designated it as public, quasi-public, and. Mm -hmm. so, we only have guidance as to what surrounds it, but what surrounds it is all single family residential. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, if she's seeking guidance, I would suggest that it's quite problematic to consider rezoning it to a bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, the comment that I, I would, would go sorry. ahead. Go uh, ahead, Gordon. Yeah. Comment that uh, the, to piggy off, piggyback off of Jeremy is, from prior experience, we know that the residents on Cross Street tend to be very vocal about changes in the neighborhood. So that's something just to keep aware of. I understand that. And uh, I will definitely keep that in mind. I also want to point out, please come by MH Pump on Winter Street. We are in the same neighborhood. We've lived and grown up in the neighborhood. My parents still live across from MH Pump on Winter Street. We've had that building for 24 years. It is in a residential area, much the same as it would be on Cross Street. And to the best of my knowledge, in the time we've been there, there's not been any complaints or problems with us and any of the neighbors. We contribute to the area in trying to make sure we keep ours clean and help out where we can with all the neighbors. And to some extent, there might be something good and having that property developed by someone who has a vested interest locally to that area. Yeah, and the difficulty we have, as Mr. Watson pointed out, is once we rezone it, the rezoning goes with the property, not with the owner. And two years later, you folks you know, could decide to sell it and the next person would not be as responsible an owner as you are, and it's still in the middle of this residential neighborhood. So something to keep. Well, and I guess we still have that problem with MH Pump on Winter Street yep. too. Then yep. the same thing could yeah. could happen uh -huh. there. Yep. But thank you. We appreciate the information. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Any other business to come before us this evening? Folks, our next meeting is Tuesday, September first. Um, I mention that only because many on many years that ends up being the Tuesday following Labor Day. And the city commission has bumps our meeting for theirs, but that's not the case this year. The first is a Tuesday, so that will be our meeting. If there's no other business for us this evening, we are adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>